You want to go dump it? Oh, there it is. Look at that. That's a good fish too. Holy crap. Oh my God, dude. Look at the size of this fish. Wow. Oh, crap. Oh, there we go. Oh, that's a good fish too. Nice. It's, it's pretty, uh, pretty insane. Look at that guy. Sweet man. Nice job. Oh, there we go. Man, he came up and hammered it. Nice. Jeez, he's strong. Holy crap, this is a bull trout. Oh, I gotta keep it in the water. Oh, oh my god. Holy crap, that's a bull trout. These are endangered in my state. Oh my god. Did you have a hit? Nice. Nice, that's a good fish. Oh shit, it's a bull trout, dude. Yeah, it is. Keep her in the water. That's a fucking bull trout. Oh my God. There we go. There's a good fish. Nice. I figured there had to be one in the shade here. Keep in the water. Oh, nice. Wow, what a thick fish. Oh my God. Wow. Oh, it's such a pain when you, you make the cast you've been trying to make after setting it in a tree. Oh, and then you don't have your camera on. Dang it! <laughs> oh, there's a fish. Oh, that's a good fish, too. Oh, not a lot of room. Oh, oh, oh my God. <laughs> that was complete chaos. So I know this seems basic to a lot of people, but it took me a couple years to learn this tip. Whenever you're stringing up your fly rod before you start fly fishing, typically in the beginning, I would try to bring the tapered leader through the little eyes and a lot of times they'd either lose a handle and have to start all over or I would even miss a guide because it's kind of hard to see the monofilament while you're running it through the guides. So a little trick, fold the fly line, the floating line, kind of in a U shape and bring that through the guides and carry the tapered leader along with it. That will help you string up this fly rod a whole lot easier the next time you're out there fly fishing. So there's your pro fly fishing tip of the trip. All right. Till the next time, everybody, fish on. Fly fishing is hard. That is 100% a myth. It is not hard. If you put in the effort and practice and get quality gear, it doesn't have to be super expensive, quality gear, spend the time practicing, fly fishing is not hard. The next myth is fly fishing is expensive. It certainly can be expensive, but it doesn't need to be. You could go to Walmart, in fact, I did this, and got a Cortland setup, flies, and leader, and I spent under $100. Now, when you start fly fishing and really get into it, you're gonna probably wanna upgrade your gear if you find that you enjoy it, but it doesn't have to be expensive to start. A pair of flip-flops, some shorts, a couple flies, a box, a rod and reel, Cortland rod and reel setup from Walmart, under a hundred bucks, you've started fly fishing. So fly fishing does not have to be expensive. Myth number three, you have to be able to cast really far to catch a fish. That is not true. I can't tell you how many fish I've caught no more than a rod's length away. I mean, if you can cast 20, 30, 40 feet, that's all you need to do to catch fish. Many fish are right next to you, I mean, they're right in front of you. So you don't need to bomb it out there in most cases to be able to catch fish. Fast action rods are easy to cast. 
That is 100% false. They are not easy to cast. It can bomb the fly out there really well, but you gotta be able to really know how to cast. Part of the reason why I designed this fly rod, a medium fast action, is it's strong enough to be able to bomb out some pretty heavy streamers, but forgiving enough for the new fly caster, there's not a lot of effort that goes into casting the rod that I designed. So the fly rod does matter. Fly line doesn't really matter. That is 100% false. You can spend 25 bucks on a reel, 50 bucks on a reel. Invest in the fly line. You're gonna have a much better experience when it comes to casting. The whole performance of your fly line does matter. I partnered up with Cortland. They have 105 years or more of history in building fly lines and they are a rock solid fly line. Invest in the fly line and you're gonna have a much better experience. So you have to have a degree in entomology to be able to be successful in fly fishing. <laughs> false you know i can argue there's 12 flies 12 flies that if you have those 12 in your box multiples of those 12 you're going to catch fish in most places i ran into a fly tire at one of my favorite fly shops recently and i said hey that's a really nice pattern that you're tying there and he goes you know this one's definitely for the fishermen and so are most of these because a lot of times flies are designed for the fishermen there are specific Kind of boring looking patterns that consistently work every single time for when you're fly fishing for trout. So just tie on something big green with big rubber legs and you're gonna catch a fish. Stop talking so much, you're gonna scare all the fish. Myth. Fly fishing is for old people. So many of the younger generation is getting into fly fishing because they're discovering, holy crap, it is so much fun to catch a fish on a fly rod. Fly fishing is an elitist sport. <laughs> One of the biggest reasons why I started this YouTube channel is because I wanted to show people that you can have success in fly fishing and you don't need to know all the terminology. You don't need to know every single size of fly. You don't need to know the grain weight of the fly line that you're using. You don't need to know a whole lot to catch fish on a fly rod. So if you hook up with the right teacher, it's, it's not an elitist sport anyone and everyone and i hope that you if you're thinking about it try fly fishing soon because you are going to love it and you don't need a phd to learn how everything fly fishing related is cheaper on amazon it is not cheaper on amazon and i have to tell you if we don't support holistically our local fly shops what are you going to do when you're on vacation right you might be in oregon idaho and you want to stop in and get some intel, spend a little money, get the hot fly. If you're buying everything else on Amazon and not supporting the local guy, those guys are not going to be able to survive and you're not going to have that resource. Go to your local fly shops and support these family-owned businesses. Fly fishers only catch small fish. Eh, that couldn't be more wrong. Fish on! Oh my God. It's a behemoth. Oh, oh, oh my god! Fish on! Oh. Oh. Wow, just so pretty. It's gonna happen. Here she comes. Oh my god! Oh, that's a good fish. First time I have to mend my life. Oh. Wow, that is a good fish. Take a glory shot. Oh, it's... Uh, yeah, <laughs> nice. Race ready. You ready? You can only use one fly when fly fishing. That is false. Now check your regulations because some, some places only allow you to use one fly, but often I'm using two flies and that increases your odds of catching fish. Typically I'll have one fly on top and I'll tie about 18 inches of lighter tippet below that fly and put another smaller fly. So I'm fishing a lot of times two flies to give myself a little bit better chance on catching fish. You do have to take care in casting though because they do have a tendency to get tangled up. Fly fishing is only for trout. That couldn't be more false. I've caught salmon on a fly rod, bonefish on a fly rod, tarpon on a fly rod, giant GTs on a fly rod, tiger muskie on a fly rod, pike on a fly rod, bass on a fly rod. You can pretty much catch anything on a fly rod. Bigger flies catch bigger fish. Now, in most cases, that's a myth because 
Kobe recently caught a brown on this tiny little 22 inch gummy midge. And that was a big fish. You can see the nymph right in his mouth, right there. Oh, dude, we need to get a photo. Yeah, this is photo worthy. The size of fly doesn't necessarily dictate the size of fish you're gonna catch. You can see this little, little fly right here, kind of a medium sized fly. I've got some whoppers on this fly. <laughs> fish. <laughs> well, if you're not casting one of these exactly perfect, then you're doing it wrong. False. There is no perfect way to cast a fly rod. You're going to develop your own style that works for you. Just follow some basic fundamentals. It'll make it easier. But there isn't a perfect way to cast a fly rod. Don't let anybody tell you that either. Fly fishing can be therapeutic. And when you're out here, all your troubles just melt away. That is 100% true. Fly fishing is catch and release only. Well, there are places that are, but you can keep fish. Just check the regs to make sure you can. I've caught some great fish and had them for dinner when I'm camping. But if you're thinking about starting fly fishing, this is the place. And these experiences that you just saw in this video is what you can experience as well. Hello there. Thanks for taking the time to click on this video. I do appreciate it. And what we're gonna talk about is we're gonna talk about the top six fly fishing websites. And now today, there are a lot of places to, to choose from, right? Uh, online stores to choose from. I'm gonna try to narrow it down to six that you definitely need to check out. And by the way, one of these family owned companies that I'm supporting, right here, Oros Indicators. I know, Bobbers Indicators. They These guys are also family owned and make the best indicator that's on the market today. No more twisting with Oros. So be sure to check them out as well. All right, let's get started. So the first website that we're gonna highlight, and you may know this website, it's called Etsy. Now, if you go on to Etsy, there are a lot of sole proprietors out there and artisans that really make some cool stuff. And I did a little shopping recently and bought some flies that caught some really big fish. I was in the market for these things called gummy midges and I could never find them in a fly shop. But I found a couple of guys, and I'll list them right here. You can see for yourself on who these people are. But they made some great flies. I got great customer service, and I caught some big fish with the flies. But if you go on to Etsy and just type in fly fishing, there are just a ton of really cool stuff in there, whether it's gift giving for somebody or just for things for yourself. But check, check them out, right? A lot of sole proprietors out there sharing their craft with you, which is pretty darn cool. All right, the next website we're gonna highlight is in my backyard. And speaking of backyard, so is Drift. And if you're looking for a new pair of waders or a rain jacket, which we need all the time here in the Pacific Northwest, or a sun shirt like this, it's worth it, right? I cannot stand putting on a bunch of suntan lotion with a sun shirt, it's SPF 50. You don't need any more lotion, which is a great thing. So check out Drift. I happen to be a pro ambassador as well. You're supporting a family owned company and you're supporting me if you use my coupon code, FlyfishDan. Back to the fly shop. So Red's Flies with one D, R-E-D-S, they are in the canyon of the Yakima River. And they also have a great YouTube presence and a great shop. In fact, I've been shopping Red's since they were a single wide sitting on a dirt lot right on the river's edge. Now, it's incredible. They're an entire lodge. You can stay there, you can build a home there. They've got a great fly shop there. They also got a great restaurant there as well. They do guided trips out of there. They'll teach you how to cast a fly rod there. They, they just have a great staff. So be sure the next time you're in the area, check out Red's Fly Shop in the Canyon and also check out their website. They've got a full catalog of pretty much everything you would ever need in fly fishing. So staying in my home state of Washington, there's another fly shop in a little known town called Iwaka. And they have a great online presence. I happen to be in Josh's shop, and I have to tell you, you need to check out his website. He's got more fly tying material than I've ever seen in any other website. And I was lucky enough to take a tour of his back room and the stuff that he has back in that back room. He, he is a fly tire himself, so is his partner. So they know quality, components, right? And they also get their hands on some of the most 
unique feathers and dubbing and, and I don't know all the terminology yet because I don't tie myself, but they have got a cornucopia of everything you would ever need for tying flies. So be sure to check out Spawn Fly Fish, their website. If you're a fly tire, it is a dream come true. If you're ever on the coast, down by Owaco, be sure to stop in and say hello as well. And by the way, if you're ever in Arizona, and I'm a little upset about my wife canceling the subscription here, but if you're looking for a great family-owned winery, this one right here, Tumbleweed in Cottonwood, Arizona, makes some pretty darn good wine. So be sure to check those guys out too, if you're in Arizona or online. Number three, number three is actually a really cool website that I recently discovered. It's called fishonrods.com and these guys are making super high-end fly rods for literally 40 to 50 percent. Hey man, oh. that's your website. Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess, I guess, that is, I guess that's my own website. That's a shameless plug right there. Yeah, that's a little plug, couldn't help it. No, seriously though, these are good rods. Yeah, we got one. And that leads me to my next website. But before we do this, this shirt right here is a great reminder. Give a hoot, don't pollute. Oh wait, that's the wrong one. No, make sure you put out your forest fire. No, don't start any forest fires by putting out your fire. There we go. I can't remember what Smokey the Bear said, but anyway, this is a good message this time of year to make sure you put the fire out so that you're not causing any big wildfires. It is that time of year. And while you're at it, you can support Angry Minnow Vintage. They're a family owned company, I believe out of Minnesota. I didn't check, I'm fairly certain. It's one of those M states. They're in the US, hey, they're a family owned company and they've got a lot of great vintage stuff from all sorts of different hats you've probably seen me wear on my channel recently in some of the t-shirts. Check out Angry Minnow Vintage. Check out Angry Minnow Vintage. Oh my gosh, I can't say it. Check out Angry Minnow Vintage. They got a lot of cool stuff. But that leads me to the next website. Now, if you're watching YouTube, you've probably seen uh, Brian from Mad River Outfitters. They got a great YouTube channel. I have not been lucky enough yet to go into their shop, but they got a great online presence. And again, you're supporting a family owned company, so check out Mad River Outfitters, both their YouTube channel and their online shop. They, they, they have a very well put together website with just tons of stuff on there. And Brian actually has a lot of great content that he puts onto YouTube, so be sure to check those guys out as well. So if you ever find yourself in Bend, Oregon, there's a town about 10 miles away called Redmond, and they have a fly shop called Finn and Fire. Again, family owned. They do a lot of guiding in and around the area as well. So if you're looking for a great fishing experience, be sure to reach out to them, but check out their website as well. They have pretty much anything and everything you might want in the fly fishing industry. So check out their website and be sure to check out their shop because I learned from a good friend of mine, you can go in there and shop and also have a beer on tap. How great is that? Having a beer while doing a little shopping for fly fishing, it's pretty darn great. And speaking of beer, I'm wearing a Crux t-shirt because they have some of the best IPAs ever made on the planet. So be sure to check out Crux. You can't go wrong with any of their IPAs. And finally, the last website we're gonna highlight today is called Red's Flies. R-E-D-D-S Flies. Jordan Red owns this company out of Atlanta, Georgia. You've probably seen, and there's a lot of different fly shops out there, online fly shops, that you can buy flies for, you know, five for a dollar. But you can pretty much rest assured that those flies are gonna just fall apart. Jordan and Red's Flies, they really do make a quality fly. So check out redsflies.com, and I've gotten some flies from there, especially the Sculptzilla. That's a big fish fly, and I've got some monster fish on his fly. So they got great big fish karma. And by the way, talking about supporting family-owned businesses and other creators. I supported Ben and bought this I Suck at Fly Fishing shirt. And you might like it for yourself too because this is super soft. It's made out of bamboo. And the one thing that I love about this shirt is the sleeves. They actually fit. There are not many long sleeve shirts that fit me. So if you're a tall fisherman, you can count on these shirts fitting you in the sleeve, which I'm pretty darn excited about. Well, hello there. If you're new to fly fishing, I'm gonna show you seven common mistakes somebody new to fly fishing usually makes. And first, let's start off with casting, right? One of the things, and I learned this on some recent tutorials, somebody said, I never thought of that. That's why I've been having so much trouble. When you cast, there needs to be a full length of floating line beyond the tip 
of your fly rod. As soon as that full length is out, so it's nine or 10 feet, then you can start peeling out some line and start your cast. A lot of new fly casters, when they first start, there's just the tapered leader sticking out the tip of their rod and it makes it really tough to fly fish when you don't have any floating line out. So that's tip number one. Tip number two is that right here on the reel. This is a large arbor, so this is a little more forgiving, but typically the fly line has a memory. So before you start fly fishing and casting, it's a good idea, especially in the winter months, to pull out some line and do a little stretch so you don't have this big coiled mess at your feet before you start fly fishing. That's more susceptible to tangling. So the next thing we're gonna talk about Really, there are numerous things that can go wrong when casting a fly rod. So instead of talking them all about them here, I'm gonna put a video right here. When you're done watching this one, go back and watch this video right here because this is gonna help you cast this thing a whole lot better. I'll give you about 10 different tips to try the next time you go out fly fishing. By the way, if you're finding this helpful, feel free to hit the thumbs up. It's free and it helps this video spread to more people that might benefit from it. And if you feel so inclined, super thanks, it's like, tipping your guide and all guides love a tip and thank you in advance so the next common mistake is gear you do get what you pay for right sunglasses make sure they're polarized you want a good lightweight polarized sunglasses fly line if if you're having if you're hating life right now it's probably because you got a crappy fly line you could spend fifty dollars on a fly reel but spend the eighty to a hundred dollars on the fly line you're gonna have a much better time of it I used to use Rio. I've now switched over to Cortland. 100 years of family-owned innovation in the fly lines. These are great fly lines. Are you still paying attention? You need to, because if you do these things, you can catch fish like this. Oh, it's a good fish. Oh my God, that's a really good fish. Oh, jeez. Oh my God. And that was an amazing fish. Next is the fly rod. If you bought that super expensive combo pack, that's a good way to start out. But again, we circle back to getting what you pay for. Part of the reason why I designed my own fly rod is I wanted to put everything you could find in a thousand dollar rod in a price point under $500. These rods are a cinch to cast and they're affordable comparatively 50 to 60% less than equal level high-end brand name rods. And yes, you probably do suck at fly fishing, but so do I on occasion. We all are going to suck at fly fishing on occasion. That's okay. The next thing are waders. Now, this may sound a little self-serving because it probably is, but when I first started out fly fishing, I was going to Kmart and Walmart and I was buying the cheapest, crappiest pair of waders I can get my hands on. And every single year they would leak and I'd go buy another pair and buy another pair. And finally I thought, hmm, maybe if I invested in a good pair of waders, they'll last a long time. I was a Sims fan for well over 15 years and they would last season after season after season. The only challenge with Sims, they can be super expensive. And that's why I now wear Drift. Drift gives you the same quality at a much lesser price point. I've been wearing mine beating the heck out of both my wading pants and my waders for a year now and I've had no problems at all. So invest in waders. You're just, you're gonna thank yourself later by investing in waders. Oh, and be sure to go to my website, fishonrods.com. Join the newsletter. Why do you wanna join the newsletter? You want to because there'll be exclusive deals and exclusive things just for members. And I promise I will not spam you to death. These emails are coming from me, not some bot. It's me, it's coming from me. So the next common mistake is a lot of new fly fishers, as you start tying on new flies, you're using a tapered leader. The further you go up the taper, the thicker the line. There comes a time that eventually you wanna tie on some new tippet to lengthen back out your tapered leader. So in this case, I'm using a nine foot tapered leader. I started getting some wind knots, get rid of those. I started to lose a couple flies and the taper kept getting shorter and getting more and more to the thicker part. So I got on some 4X tippet. I tied a double surgeon's knot, which is my preferred knot to tie on tippet to a tapered leader and lengthened it back out to nine feet. Why is that important? One, you're probably gonna scare the fish away using 20 pound test unless you're fishing for tarpon or bonefish. And you have to build upon the taper so that the fly rolls over and presents well. If you have a really short taper, it's gonna kind of clunk right on the water. So if you start chopping into your tapered leader, lengthen it back out or put a new one on. Another common mistake new fly fishers make 
is they hotspot when they go on social media. Now, I know that that might sound hypocritical because at one point it was. So the next common mistake is a big one, a really big one. And fly shops are going to love me for this because don't just buy one fly. Never do that. Never do that because the inevitability is you're going to catch a really big fish on this fly and you might break it off and you don't have any more flies. I always at least buy flies in pairs, if not triplets or quadruplets. The next biggest mistake is some of you might be tempted to buy a leader straightener. Don't waste your money. Use your fingers. The leader straightener, if you put any too much pressure on your line, it just turns it, just completely screws it up and melts it. So use your finger. It works great if you've got a curled line. Just generate a little heat and away it goes. The next big mistake, and I occasionally do this myself even today, is that I don't take the time to unravel a tapered leader. Take the time to carefully unravel a brand new tapered leader when you take it out of the package. Otherwise, you're gonna get your first knot before you even tie it onto your fly line. So take the time to do that. So the next common mistake is that you don't have enough gear. And what I mean by that is that you wanna have enough packages of tapered leader in different sizes in case things change, right? If all of a sudden the fish get really persnickety and you got to put on 5X tippet, if you don't have a 5X tippet or a 5X tapered leader, you're screwed. You're not going to catch any fish. So I always have in my bag 0X, 1X, 2X, 3X, 4X, 5X, and I never use 6X because what's the point? So the next common mistake, and this probably goes more towards the younger generation, a lot of times you guys forget sunscreen. Don't forget sunscreen because when you're my age, you'll be happy that you wear sunscreen because you won't be a wrinkled up old prune. The next common mistake, and this goes for anyone that's fishing a saline lake or salt water, don't leave your gear sitting around. Take the time to wash your gear completely. What I do is take it in the shower, take a shower with my fly rod, peel off all the line, let it fall on the floor where all the soap and stuff is, and reel it back in, rinse everything off. Take the time to even take the reel apart and get inside there if you fish in the salt water. It's super important you maintain your gear. And then maybe put maybe a drop of real oil after you're done. Another big common mistake I see, there are occasions that you're gonna have to carry your rod like this when you're walking down a trail. But if you can, turn it around and carry it like this. Because the inevitability of you stabbing it into something or maybe you get lazy and it's starting to go further and further down and you poke it into the ground, you're gonna break a rod. So make it a habit to carry the rod backwards when you walk down your favorite trail. The next common mistake is that people buy a fly vest <laughs> because they're one of the most uncomfortable things on the planet. What I like to wear is a sling pack. This thing is ergonomic. It's like I'm wearing a backpack. And the difference between a sling pack and a backpack is that I can access things pretty easily right here, nets dangling off. It's just a nice little workstation. If you're wearing a backpack, you gotta take everything off and then dig around in your backpack for your gear. So I found that a bigger sling pack, and I use one from Sims here, I have everything I need in this sling pack and it's easily accessible and it's comfortable when I'm walking down the trails. And typically I forget to do this, but this makes it even better. If you clip this little clip right here, nice, love it. And the other thing, and I don't know if you guys have witnessed this before. If you hand somebody that's been spin fishing their entire life and you hand them a fly rod and say, yeah, let's fly fish today. And they set the rod on the ground, the reel on the ground and start pulling line out. One of my best friends did that. I handed him a fly rod. He set it on the ground, started pulling line and the reels just jumping on the ground. All right, so do not set this on the ground because it spins when you pull the line out and it's gonna just destroy your reel. So if you're fishing off a beach, don't set it in the sand. If you're putting line on, don't set it on the ground. Put it on something soft in your car, whatever. Just make sure that you're on the leeward side if there's any wind so the door doesn't slam on it and break your rod. All right, well, I covered way more than seven things, but hey, hopefully there might be something in there that you might find useful. All right, you clicked on this video because you want to learn how to cast one of these better, more better, better than you are today. All right, I'm going to show you five casting tips using one of these fly casting rods. Be sure to stick to the end because I've got 
a mind-blowing cast. It took me a long time to figure this one out. And when I learned it, I was like, oh my God, it was an epiphany moment. So stick with me. I'll show you a technique that'll take a lot of frustration out of casting, especially in tight spaces. All right, let's get to the tutorial. The first is what I call water loading. I think a lot of people call it water loading. But typically when you fly cast, you're going to be doing some false casting, right? To be able to get it out there. But sometimes you have a fly or a fly setup that's really tough to false cast. I have a dry fly. That's pretty easy. But if I had a dropper on the end of this thing, it'd make it very difficult to keep false casting and avoid tangles. So there's something called water loading. And what you do essentially is you just do a one pickup and a one lay down. And the water tension on the line, you pick it up quick and throw it out once. And that's called water loading. So you're not false casting at all. So essentially your line's out there, it's tight. You can do a single haul to help speed things up. Single haul it up, throw it out. You're fishing it, single haul it up, throw it out. That is called water loading. And sometimes if you want to get a little bit further out there, you can water load your way out. So water load, water load, water load. See, there's a fish. I want to make sure. So that's called water loading. Another casting technique is called the roll cast. And if you have a place, now there's a lot of, there's a lot of open space here, but a lot of times when you're fishing places like this, and there are sections on this creek that don't have a lot of room. So you want to learn how to roll cast. And essentially what that is, is you're throwing your line out without actually doing a back cast. So you bring your rod up to about one o'clock, create kind of a D loop in the floating line. There's a little bit of floating line in the water and then you just kind of snap your wrist forward and that kind of throws everything out just like that. That is called a roll cast. Right now I got a little bit of wind pushing my fly back. Typically everything will roll out nice. Let's try it again. So one o'clock created a D loop and just a quick snap and just everything goes out there real nice. So that is called a roll cast. Now the next thing you want to be able to learn, and we talked about it on the water loading, is a single haul. Single hauling is a casting technique that just allows you to shoot the line out there a lot faster and a lot easier. What it does is you, as you haul it down on the pickup, it loads the rod. And what that means is it's building a lot of energy into the rod, which then transfers it into the line. You can best see it in slow motion. Right When you're pulling down on the line, right as the line is completely extending forward, or in this case, out in front of you, it quickly loads the rod. There's a bend in the rod, and then when you kind of release things and you're ready to cast, that bend in the rod that transfers the energy into the fly line and shoots the line out. And that's essentially how casting works, right? It's important to make a nice, efficient loop, technique, and all those things, but that, in a nutshell, it's the energy being generated into the rod, transferring it into the line. That's what gets it out there. So a single hauling, if you want to shoot it out quickly, pull down with your non-casting hand while lifting up the rod and shoot the line out. Watch how this goes, right? Pull down. That is called a single haul. Double hauling can be tricky, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but learn the single haul. It really will increase your one-time cast, right? A lot of fly casters, to get that out there, do a lot of false casting to where all they really need to do is do a single haul and then throw it out there. And it goes just as far as you were just false casting it. So a great technique to use. I'll kind of show it this way. So pull down, shoot out. Pull down, shoot out. Now the next casting technique is called a double haul. And typically you're not gonna use the double haul when you're fishing a small creek like this. But this is a lesson. We happen to be on a small creek and I'll show you what the double haul is. A little windy, hopefully the camera will stay there. Sorry about the wind. All right, so when it comes to the double haul, it's a pretty good example with a little bit of wind, right? What you're doing is you're increasing the line speed you're attempting to load the rod and load the rod more so than just standard casting, right? You can see kind of the bend in the rod just from 
standard casting. Well, when you start double hauling, that bend increases because you're, you're influencing the line and really trying to load up the rod so that you can shoot that cast out there a lot further than not double hauling. So you can kind of see it's an up-down motion. I'm exaggerating it here. But that is the double haul, and it's great during windy conditions to be able to get the line out there. I actually shot a video up in Alaska and slowed it down, and it was a really great example. And I'll B-roll that in right now of what that double haul looks. You can see the line goes all the way back. I'm pulling down the line to influence it forward. And then when I come back, I'm pulling down the line again. It's about timing to influence it back, right? I'm putting a big bend on the rod. And then as you can see, when I'm ready to deliver the fly, I'm doing one big pull down, right? I'm, that last haul is a doozy and you can shoot out a lot of line by doing that. Notice the last, you know, right? The line's going back and I really pull down hard on my non-casting hand to load that rod. And you can see the bend in the rod is tremendous. And that bend, that energy that's stored up into the rod is what transfers it into the line and shoots it all out there. So if you learn to double haul, it'll really increase the distance of your cast. Now the other tip I want to give you is not all casting is traditional, right? You can make a sidearm cast. Same principles apply, right? If you need to get keep the fly low to the water or you got some tree branches, you can do a nice side sidearm cast. You can even do kind of a sidearm roll cast, just like that. You don't have to be straight up and down, right? I typically hold my rod away from my body during a cast well, I don't want to hold the hook, the hook the camera. I usually keep the fly rod away from my body during a cast because I don't want the fly coming back and hitting me. So that's just a preference that's worked for me. But it doesn't always have to be straight up and down. As long as you keep those techniques all into place, you can do sidearm casts. You can do sidearm roll casts. I mean, there's a lot you can do without having to go straight up and down. So don't feel that, like you're locked into... You know, this is the only way that you can cast, right? You can do a lot of, a lot of crazy things, sidearm, really low, and be able to shoot that fly right into a place that you're trying to cast. Like those trees over there, you can kind of see they're low. I can go low and shoot it right underneath there really easy by just doing a nice sidearm. And that just keeps, you know, your fly out of the trees. It's going to happen, but they're, we're a lot less likely if you're doing that type of cast. So... No, once you really start learning to fly cast, there's going to be a lot of variations. And as long as the mechanics are still where they need to be, it's, you know, it does make a, a great dif a difference, right? You don't always have to just traditionally cast. Mechanics are there. You can do a lot of things, even like an, an overhand cast, right? Say if the wind was blowing this way and I don't want the fly to hit me, I can just change my shoulder and you notice the mechanics are exactly the same. Fly's going out there nice and easy, but I'm just using an over the shoulder cast. So as long as the mechanics stay the same, side arm, over the shoulder, it, it's gonna go out there. So don't get hung up on one way to do it, right? You're gonna start feeling it. When you're out there and pretty soon you're just gonna automatically just start creatively casting as you're trying to cast around stuff and you're gonna think to yourself, wow, I just did that without even thinking because it just becomes like muscle memory and just a natural thing for you. So give yourself time, give yourself patience, give yourself permission to fail when it comes to casting. But I promise you, it's gonna click, you're gonna get there and it's gonna come sooner than you think. Oh my God, I almost forgot one of the biggest aha moments I've ever had in fly casting and that's called the reach cast. So the beauty of a reach cast is Kind of like the roll cast, right? If you've got something in your way, you're trying to get out there, right? But you've got a bunch of trees right there. You can cast parallel to the stream. And at the very end, move your fly tip, tip of your rod out towards the stream and your fly line and fly magically follow it. It's pretty cool. You can't go a complete hard 90, but you can do probably a strong 60 degrees and still get a great presentation. And then do a quick mend because a lot of times you get a loop in your line, but Try that next time. Parallel to whatever it is that you're fishing, and at the very end, send your fly tip to the, to the left or to the right, depending on where you're standing, and watch the fly line and fly 
follow it right over. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about this fly rod used in the tutorial, I'll leave a link down in the description or you can check out fishonrods.com. Part of the reason why this is such an easy casting rod is because Neil and I designed it to be just that. This thing has everything a thousand to an $1,100 rod has for 40 to 50% less. Oh, there we go. That's a good fish. So let's talk about what I targeted there. I had just a feeling that the big fish could be in this section of the river. You got fast current that drops off the edge. You got a lot of rocks. You got a lot of back current. There's a lot of places for fish to hide in this section. Now, I'm using a floating line, but a very heavily weighted Scopezilla. So I actually used the current that was right in front of me to help pull the fly down and get it deep. And sure enough, right on the swing, right, it was almost like a like an upstream, downstream swing to where the bend of the line was going way downstream and the fly was upstream. So the presentation of the fly, right, it started to swing and then started to swim downstream deep because my line's being pulled down by the current that's right up in the front. And sure enough, the fish hit it right in that zone. So look for that kind of structure when you're fishing streams. And if you've got multiple currents, use those to your advantage to help suck the line down to get a little deeper so you might be able to find a fish like that beautiful, beautiful West Slope Cutthroat. Oh, big, big fish. Really swift. Oh, yeah. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Yeah, oh, oh. oh my God, look at that fish. Oh. Wow, cute. Oh. Hello there, thanks for tuning into my channel. I do appreciate it. Today, I'm gonna show you a casting technique called the reach cast. Now. You can kind of see where Jeff's sitting, right? There's a lot of stuff in your way here. So you can do similar to what he has done uh, when he was fishing here. He did a nice roll cast to get the line out. Nice roll cast. Yeah, learn from the best. But there's also something called the reach cast because there's really no way right now for you to get the fly out over there without either doing the roll cast or what they call the reach cast. And essentially what the reach cast is, is that your fly is gonna go, your fly line is gonna go where the tip of your rod goes. So if you can see, I'm casting right now parallel to the, sh the shore. I'm gonna steer the fly out to the right, right at the very end, and the fly is gonna go that way. So even though I've got all this stuff here, I'm gonna shoot it out this way by using the reach cast. So I'm casting parallel, and then right at the end, I'm gonna shoot it outwards. And just like that, the fly landed way out in the lake. So that is called the reach cast. So let me demonstrate that once again. So you're fishing, you're fishing parallel, or you're casting parallel to the shore, right? Because right now, if I were to cast this way, it would just go up into the trees here. And at the very end, just point the rod tip out on the final presentation cast and everything follows, watch. Just like that, and there's a fish rising out there, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna catch it. So ready, reach cast. So just like that, everything just, oh, oh man. Oh, I missed it. Dang it. So, 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 oh, oh my God. So, oh, it's here. So there you go. So if you perform the reach cast, you can get the fly basically out in the lake, even though you have all this stuff in the back cast. So try that next time that you have limited space, perform the reach cast and you're gonna find how much e how easy it is just to shoot the line straight out, even though you really can't, right? Because it just follows the tip 
of your or fall, the fly line falls to the tip of your fly rod. Just like that. And you're over 30 feet out there. Yeah. So there's your fly fishing tip for the day. Well, hello there. Thanks for taking the time to click on this video. And in this video, I'm gonna to try to take the confusion out of tapered leaders and tippet material. We're gonna go over the difference in the X's. You might see that some of them have a 5X or a 4X. I'll explain what that means. And also why you might wanna use nylon versus fluorocarbon. So stick with me to the end because I got a giveaway that might interest you. And as I'm giving a lesson, Kobe's <laughs> catching fish. Oh, dang it. So what the X stands for in tippet and tapered leader essentially is the diameter of the fly line. So if you're using smaller flies, a lot of times you'll want to use a larger X number. So it's kind of the opposite, right? The larger, like 5X, has a smaller diameter than 3X. So you'll also notice with the X, like on a 5X, there's a poundage rating as well. So for example, 5X has a six pound rating. Now it also stands for the diameter, thinner diameter, six pound rating. You can see the 4X has an 8.4 pound rating. So the X also correlates with the breaking strength of the line as well. So when do you use a 5X or a 4X or a 3X? So typically, if you're using smaller dry flies and you need a little bit lighter presentation or maybe there's a little bit spookier fish, you might wanna use a 5X. Now you'll notice I don't have anything smaller than 5X because why bother, right? <laughs> Unless you're using flies of this size, that's really the only time you're gonna need a 6X or a 7X. So I almost left 4X tip it out. How dare I, because that really is the most common size tapered leader used in fly fishing. When you first start out, when you tie on 5X, you are likely gonna break some fish off because you have to get used to the balance of power and quickness when the initial set happens on the fish. So don't be surprised if you're using 5X and you're just starting out, you're probably gonna break a few fish off. 4X is just light enough to be able to tie on some smaller flies and heavy enough to handle some small woolly buggers and leeches without a problem of them snapping off. So it's a good all-purpose middle ground when fly fishing, when, especially when you first start out by using a 4X nine-foot tapered leader and matching tippet. So why would you wanna use a 3X? So 3X typically, if you're using big terrestrial patterns, you're gonna to wanna to use a 3X. One, because the fish are gonna be less spooky, right? They really don't care about the leaders sitting on the water when you're using big bugs like that. And also you need just a little bit thicker line because some of those terrestrials have a tendency to twist when you're casting them. So if you're gonna reduce the amount of twisting in your line, use a heavier or like a 3X or even a 2X type of tippet or tapered leader. Now with your tapered leaders, typically if you're just starting to get into fly fishing and you're fishing for trout, 95% of the time I'm using a nine foot tapered leader. Some people have asked, well, why can't I just tie some monofilament on the end of my fly line? That taper helps roll the fly over and finish a fly cast. So without that taper, it's really tough to kind of nicely present or roll the fly out. Now you'll also notice that I've got nylon leaders and I've got fluorocarbon. Why would you wanna choose one over the other? So nylon has a tendency to float a little bit better than fluorocarbon. So if you're fishing dry flies, a lot of times you wanna use nylon. It stretches a little bit more and also floats a little better. Fluorocarbon is better for sinking type of flies with you know, a lot of wet flies, streamers, and that type thing. It's also more abrasion resistant. Now, nylon, is abrasion resistant, fluorocarbon even more so. Fluorocarbon has less tendency to stretch as well. So you wanna make sure you really secure your knot well as well with using fluorocarbon. But fluorocarbon will roll over a heavier streamer better than nylon, just because it's a stiffer type of line. So you wanna use fluorocarbon with your fishing toothy fish as well. Recently, Kobe and I went to Pyramid Lake and all we were fishing was fluorocarbon because these fish have teeth and you need something really abrasion resistance uh, when you're fishing these giant toothy fish. So next question, why do I need a nine foot tapered leader and why do I need tippet? There's two reasons why you're gonna need tippet. Tippet will add length 
to your nine foot tapered leader. As you're tying on flies, you're gonna keep shortening that nine foot leader. And you're gonna notice that your casting and the presentation of the fly just kind of reduces in quality, gets harder as your line gets shorter. So a lot of times you need to extend that line out and that's where you use the tippet material to extend back out so you can again reach nine feet on your taper. A lot now another reason is that let's say you need a little extra depth you're fishing an indicator setup you got a nine foot tapered leader but you got to get down there a little bit further you might want to tie on a three or four foot section of tippet to the end of your nine foot tapered leader and now you're fishing with a 12 to 13 foot tapered leader so you follow me here another reason you use tippet is to tie on the second fly you've probably heard hopper dropper right to get to the dropper you need to tie on some tippet to the back end of that hopper. You can do that with two nymphs. You can also fish two streamers as well by just tying a piece of tippet. What I like to do is either match the line size. So if you're using 3X tapered leader, I'm using a 3X or lighter tippet behind that first fly. Why is that if you end up getting it stuck on the bottom or stuck on a tree branch, you're gonna be far more likely to at least get one fly back if the back portion of that setup is a little bit lighter on on your tippet size so you could potentially save one fly and not lose both pro tip for you if you're fishing streamers don't have anything lighter than 3x if you're casting right now and it's snapping off during the cast you're probably using 4x and that's just not strong enough to cast some of these really big streamers so streamers 3x or larger. So my recommendation, if you're just starting out, you want to have 5X, 4X, and 3X tapered leaders. And I would go with the nylon if you're just fishing lakes or your backyard stream and match it with nylon tippet. If you know you're, you're fishing for some pretty toothy fish, maybe you got a lot of cutthroat in the backyard, then you probably want to have some fluorocarbon with you as well in the same sizes. All right, pro tip for, all right, pro tip for you. Try saying that 10 times fast. Wet your knots first. Use your mouth, a little saliva. Your knots will seat a lot better whether you're tying a clinch knot or whether you're tying a double or triple surgeons. Wet it first. You're going to find a lot better knot strength. Another pro tip. When you take a brand new nylon or fluorocarbon leader out of its little plastic bag for the first time, take your time, unravel it, right? If you go too quickly, you're probably gonna tangle it all up and you're gonna have a big old knot in a brand new tapered leader. So take the time when you're taking it out. And also don't use a leader straightener. Use your finger, generate a little bit of heat and you'll find that it'll straighten right out nicely for you by just using your fingers and just use a little heat and it'll straighten right out for you. Take the curls out. fish on yet yeah, yeah that's that's a good one nice <laughs> that's that fish has got some shoulders nice. well hello there kobe and i are fishing a new lake today we're going to talk a little bit about still water tactics today and now i want you to stick to the end of the video because there are two things and two flies that i do that pretty much guarantee me fish every time out. Now, since I said that, I'll get skunked today, but I don't often get skunked because I have a strategy that I'll share with you a little bit later. But how do you find success when fishing Stillwater? So if you have them, the first thing you wanna do is bring a couple of setups with you, right? I usually have two fly rods with me, one that has a floating line, and generally I'm doing something on top, whether it's dry fly or indicator setup or another is an intermediate, right? Have those two set up so you can either get the fish that are up towards the top of the water column and that intermediate or sinking line will help you get down into the water column and get those fish that are down a little bit deeper. So that's the first thing I would do. The next thing I would do is I would check with your state and look at the stocking reports, right? A lot of times 
like Fish and Wildlife will point you into the direction. We're on this lake because they just stocked a thousand fish. So our odds are gonna go up in catching fish because we read the stocking report. So I would encourage you to Google your state. I'm sure they probably have a stocking report, especially for these slower days during the winter time. Oh, there we go. That's a nice fish. Sweet. All right, now that you know where to go, pay attention to what's happening, right? Fish will give you an idea of what's happening. If you see a fish boil on top, but they don't break the surface, they're probably eating something just subsurface. If you see fish exploding on top, then that pretty much tells you that you need to find a dry fly and take a look around to see what's flying around. And with that being said, look at the water. Some of the best chronomid fishing I've ever had is because I've seen the casing sitting on the water and realized that the fish that are boiling just under the surface are eating chronomids. So tie on a chronomid. So pay attention to what's happening. If you don't see anything at all, right? There's no boils, there's no bugs. That's when you get out your sinking and or intermediate line, put on a woolly bugger, put on a sparkle minnow, put on a subsurface fly, and then go after them that way. But pay attention to what's happening on the lake. Next is you want to vary your fishing technique, right? And not just getting out the floating line or getting out the intermediate line or sinking line. It's varying up what you're doing. Recently, Kobe and I were at Pyramid Lake and we weren't catching any fish. And all of a sudden, I was reeling in my line as fast as I could because I wanted to change up and a fish grabbed it. Well, that told me I needed to vary my retrieve and make it a faster retrieve. So do some different things while you're out there fishing and vary it up, right? If you're fishing an indicator and it's just sitting there and nothing's happening, give it a little motion. If you're fishing a like a, like a bugger or a streamer setup and you're fishing it real slow, nothing happens, speed up the retrieve. Vary up your presentation and a lot of times that will find you success. Also, when you're fishing indicators, pro tip for you, vary up your depth, right? Start at maybe four, three to four feet below the indicator. If you don't get anything, right? You're not seeing any rises. Lower your setup from the indicator. So vary your depth as well. If you're not getting anything after uh, 20 minutes or so is kind of my rule of thumb. I'm changing up the depth and trying to find where the fish are in the water column. Typically when fly fishing still water, you're gonna use either 5X nine foot tapered leaders, 4X or 3X. And I also prefer Cortland. They've been around for over a hundred years and I just trust that brand. Here we go. Whoa, that's a good fish too. <laughs> oh, geez. That's strong fish. Oh, God. Wow. All right, so what's my secret? The secret two things that I do, number one, is if it ain't working after 20 minutes, change up. I recently was Pyramid Lake and I probably tied on oh, 30 or 40 different flies in those four days that I was fishing. But if I don't get anything in the first 20 minutes, I'm changing up, right? You have to vary it up. If you're not catching fish on that fly, tie on something else. And a lot of times, tie two flies on, right? That gives you twice the chance to catch a fish. Pro tip for you, when you're fishing two flies, a lot of times that second fly, I tie some tippet to the end. It's usually the same size of tippet that I'm using on the tapered leader or one size down. That way, if you get snagged, you get one fly back. And it's between 18 and 24 inches on the dropper. And what two flies seem to always work and what I'm gonna tie on today to start out with is the squirmy wormy and the mop fly. Now, I know some of you might think that that's cheating. You know what though? If it catches you fish, who cares? But if you're not catching anything on streamers, you're not catching anything on coronamids, tie on a pink squirmy wormy and tie on a mop fly. And usually those two things, one being the main fly, one being the dropper, are lights out. Oh, that's a good fish. That is a trout. Yeah, no kidding. Nice. Sweet. Very good. By the way, I use Oros indicators. If you're tired of your indicators getting all twisted up, switch to Oros. These things really are one of the most genius things invented in fly fishing in the past 10 years. And by the way, if you wanna see more exclusive content, feel free to join 
my fly fishing club that I just opened up on the YouTube channel. There's three levels to choose from, but go on to my channel, click join, it'll kind of explain everything that you get by being a member of this exclusive club. And thank you in advance for the support. All right, well, I hope that helps you the next time you're out fishing still water. Hello there. Thanks for tuning into my channel. Kobe and I are out here in our favorite mountain lake doing a little fishing, and I thought, you know what? Something I haven't done yet on this channel is talk about fish handling. So we're gonna to talk today about some of the ways or best practices in handling a fish after you catch it. Now, if you were just getting into fly fishing, a lot of times if you go to those stock ponds, people, you probably see people dragging fish up on the bank or up on the grass. That's not how you wanna do it on catch and release fisheries. You wanna to try to keep the fish in the water as much as you can. And I'm here to tell you, if you lift the fish out of the water for a couple of seconds to take a picture, it's okay. So if you are gonna grab that photo, right, you wanna lift the fish out of the water just for a couple seconds, be sure to wet your hands first. Why that's important is that fish have a protective layering or slime that helps, you know, keep parasites and all the bad stuff that could potentially hurt a fish. That's what protects the fish long term. So use a net that has that catch and release tile webbing. If we're using a nylon net, that's really tough on the fish and it's probably not going to survive in those cases. So get one of those catch and release nets, wet your hand before touching the fish. Super important. And then let the fish go. Winter time, don't use gloves unless they're fish approved. And I'm not really sure if there's really any such thing as a fish approved glove that you can handle a fish with. But whenever I'm fishing in the winter, I'm going to pull my glove off, take a little picture of the fish and let her go. But yeah, super important to wet your hands if you're going to hold that fish up for that Instagram photograph. Now, typically Kobe and I will fish barbless hooks because if you ever caught one of those fish that doesn't seem to have any cheeks or mandibles, it's because generally people are using barbed hooks and they kind of tear it out of the fish's mouth and then they just don't really have a mouth anymore. So it's always the best practice. You're not gonna lose more fish by using barbless hooks, but it's way better on the fish. Oops, I'm not sure, <laughs> am I gonna hit this? I might hit a log here. <laughs> Time out here, hold on just a sec disaster avoided. So when it comes to handling the fish, you want to try to keep the fish in the water as much as possible, even when it's in the net. The longer you lift it out of the net, the more chance, the higher the mortality rate goes up. So I do my best to keep the fish in the water during the unhooking process. And again, it's, it's okay to lift it out for a nice snapshot if you want to post it on Facebook, Instagram, or wherever your preference. Totally okay. Now when it comes to playing the fish, have fun. You know, there are some people out there that talk about, you know, you could overplay a fish. You're on a three-way. You got to get the fish in right away. The fish are pretty resilient. If you play the fish out, and as long as you're fishing in temperatures, you know, of water that's 50, 60 degrees, you're going to be fine. When you start getting into the 70 degree range, that's when you're going to start killing the fish. So typically, if it's that warm out, I'm not fishing anymore. So with standard water temperatures or normal water temperatures, play the fish out. Have fun with it. Get in the net as soon as it's ready. And you're gonna know when the fish is ready to get in the net. The mortality rate's not gonna go up if you play the fish out, tire them out, put them in the net and release them. So that's really the best practice when it comes to playing a fish, handling a fish and releasing a fish. And it's also okay if you need, wanna keep one. Just check the regs to make sure that you can wherever you're fishing. All right, well, I hope that helps you if you're new to fly fishing and really new to fishing, right? And just some responsible fish handling. I have to tell you, it still feels weird that I'm fishing with my fly rods. How friggin' cool is that? I got a fly fishing tip for you. Now, unconsciously, I've been doing this when I've been fly casting, especially if I've got to tuck it into a bank between some lily pads, or in this case, I'm getting it as close to that drop off and stick as I possibly can. Something that'll help you with accuracy so you too can catch fish like this. Keep them in the water. Oh, nice. Wow, what a thick fish. Is there's a little technique. Now, I'm gonna give credit to where credit's due. I don't know who the fly casting instructor was, but she was at Red's Fly Shop doing a class, and Mark, my buddy, said, hey, I learned something new. Even though I've been casting a long time, she taught me this tip, and I started thinking, you know what? I do that all the time, and I just don't even think about it. 
But when it comes to accuracy, right at the end of the cast, right, your last presentation where you're shooting for whatever it is you're shooting for, just tighten your grip a little bit on the court. That just gives you a little bit more control on the rod so you can potentially hit that spot you're, you're looking for. And that is something that I've been doing forever. I don't even know how long, but I realized, wow, okay, I do that, right? When I, I started paying attention and when I started shooting for certain things, right, I need to get the fly close. It's like, I'm really gripping that cork much harder than I typically would on any other cast. And that just kind of helps stabilize and focus the rod where you're trying to aim it. So try that next time you're out there fly fishing. If you're trying to tuck it into a bank, just squeeze onto that cork a little tighter than you typically would right on that presentation portion of the cast. And I think you might find you'll get a little closer to that target that you're aiming for. It's worked for me over all the years and it took somebody to teach it at Red's Flies down in the canyon uh, for me to realize that, hey, that's a pretty good tip. I need to share that. All right, and I'll try to get that person's name and put her, uh, put her information down in the description as well because she deserves credit because that's a great tip. There we go. There's a good fish. Nice. I figured there had to be one in the shade here. Keep him in the water. Oh, nice. Wow, what a thick fish. Oh my God. Back by popular demand, we're gonna do another video about some fly fishing websites you may or may not have heard of. But I'm pretty sure the last one we're gonna cover You've never heard of this one. So I also need a little bit of help. If you guys know of any websites that I should be highlighting or would like to see me highlight, drop those websites down in the comments. Don't leave the link because my filter will block it out, but talk about them and I'll Google them and I'll cover them on the next video. So thanks for your help with that. Now, one of the, one of the fly shops that kind of surprised me, right? I don't know how this never got on my radar, but on the last video I was talking about this and somebody said, hey, what about fly fish food? They even have a YouTube channel. So I looked them up and sure enough, how this never hit my homepage, I, I don't know. They've got like 74,000 subscribers and they've got some really good stuff on their YouTube channel. But they also have a very large online presence and a couple of mega stores, one in Utah and one in Idaho Falls. But be sure to check out fly fish food. I mean, from the looks of it, their website looks really solid. Tons of stuff and you know what? I wish I had a mega store in my neighborhood. That sounds pretty cool. But I think they also, I was kind of looking through their videos, it appears that they might have opened up another store just recently as well. So the next website we're gonna cover is called Trident Fly Fishing. And they've got a pretty big presence. In fact, I went down their fly rod list. They appear to have every single brand of fly rod ever made. Huge presence online. They also appear to have a store in Wyndham, Maine. Ben Freeman is the founder. I'm not sure if it's still family owned or not. Maybe somebody that knows the shop could let me know, but it appears to be, but they have a great presence online and evidently a fly shop over in Wyndham, Maine. So be sure to check them out as well. And so I promised myself on this video, I would not talk about my website, fishonrods.com. Not gonna do it. Just, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep my website completely off this video. We're not gonna talk about these fly rods that are really awesome and super affordable, the top notch. We're gonna, we're gonna keep fish on rods out of this video. That's the promise I made and I'm gonna keep it. So the next website we're gonna talk about is in my home state and it's Emerald Water, <laughs> I can never say that name. Emerald, Emerald Water Anglers. Why is that a tongue twister for me? I have no idea. But they're over in West Seattle and they could use a little bit of love. Dave McCoy's the owner of that shop, been there a lot of years. We had a major bridge that connected Seattle to West Seattle, which was closed because of cracks for like over two years and it really did hurt his business. So it's back open now. You could probably use some love. Head over there if you're local, say hello, take a look at his shop. He's got a great shop, lots of flies, which I always appreciate, comfortable. They got some leather chairs in there. You can just kind of sit back and relax but it's a great shop and they also have a great online presence as well. So I'm sure the guys down at Emerald Water, em, Emerald Water Anglers, it's like a tongue twister, Emerald Water, Emerald Water Anglers, Emerald Water Anglers, <laughs> my God. All right, you, you can see it in the video, so you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so the last website we're gonna cover, 
something I'm fairly certain that you've never heard of is Ed's Fly Shop. See, I can say that one, that's easy. Ed's Fly Shop in Montrose, Colorado. This guy started in 2010 out of his garage and he's built a great online presence and he's got a great shop in Colorado. Never been there, but I've seen some pictures and it looks pretty good and come on, have you ever been to a bad fly shop? So check out Ed's website right here and if you're in the Colorado area, give him a shout out and check out his shop if you're ever in Montrose, Colorado. All right, you live in the Puget Sound and you want to fly fish for sea run cutthroat. So what do you need? So you might want to get a pair of waders, but typically I wear boots because a lot of the beaches that I'm fishing are a pretty steep drop off. So I don't really need to wade out that far, but there are places to wear waders or hip boots might be more ideal. You're going to need a stripping basket. Otherwise your line's going to get wrecked really quick. So get a stripping basket. I have a really light one from, uh, what is this? I'm trying to read it upside down. Is that coastal? Deep coastal? Well, I'll give, it, I'll give it a shot there. But it's, it's really nice and lightweight and it keeps the line off your feet and getting tangled up in the rocks and sticks and seaweed and everything else. You need at least a five weight. So this is my own, this is the FFD5. I was actually kind of curious to see how it was gonna do with, sea, uh, with the Sea Run Cutthroat Fishery. And I'm pleasantly surprised that with this medium fast action rod, it is getting this popper out there pretty easy. I got a remix reel and I've got an outbound short uh, put on this it's it's lined up so this is a six weight outbound short and it seems to be casting really actually really well I can shoot out the line with just one false cast and I'm shooting it out 60 feet really easy you want to find beaches that have a current if you don't have a current you're probably not going to catch any sea run cutthroat so find a place with the current you can use streamers I was using a streamer to start you got nothing and then I tied on this popper right here and had a fish and got another resident black mouth too which was kind of cool Came up and grabbed it. Oh, and he's off. Damn it. Lost the fish, but you know, that's that's part of it. I've got a net sitting on my pack. And by the way, you, you do want a pack. I've just got a little fanny pack that's waterproof. And I've got a little magnetic catch for my net. I've got some sunglasses, polarized, a hat, a sun shirt, because I don't like putting on sunscreen. Let's see, what else, what else do we have? You can get stripping guards, otherwise you start cutting into your fingers. I've got them. I was just too lazy to dig them out, so I wasn't using stripping guards. But once you've got all that, you're ready to go, right? And and there's a selection of flies from you know a lot of a lot of trout stuff works really well. But I've got this one particular fly from Spawn Flyfish. I don't know what it's called. It's peach with a bead head, but it's really effective. I've caught some fish in the past with it. But this popper is so much fun to see the fish come up and blast this popper. Oh, and you know, you do want to get, right? Some people will fish an intermediate line, but you know, I've had great luck with just doing a floating line in this outbound short. So you can get an intermediate, but I, I think you're going to probably get stuck on the bottom. And then lastly, you got to pack your patience, right? You're, you're going to be picking off seaweed from your flies, your line, pretty much everything all day long. So you do have to pack your patience when it comes to sea run cutthroat fishing. But other than that, find a beach with a current incoming tide is is usually what i like to fish but outgoing is good too as long as you have some current and you'll get into some of these cool sea run cutthroat trout out here in the Puget sound oh almost forgot i'm using 2x tapered leaders which are about 10 pound test and that's plenty you can use 0x 1x or 2x i wouldn't go any lighter than 2x and the reason why i wouldn't go any lighter than 2x is because some of these flies you're using are pretty heavy and they'll snap off on the back cast. So you need a little heavier leader to be able to keep the flies attached. I got another pro fly fishing tip for you. Saltwater tip. When you're done with the fly, you're changing up, don't put it back in the box. You do that, it's gonna get the rest of them salty and you're gonna potentially have a whole bunch of rusty flies. So have a little container on all the flies you've used, put in that container so when you get home, you can rinse them off. And that really goes for any type of saltwater fly fishing. All right, everybody, thanks so much for tuning in. I appreciate it. I almost dropped my rod. Oh, there's a fish. Oh, that's a good fish too. Oh, not a lot of room. Oh 
man, it's a heavy fish. That is a sizable fish. Oh my god, another vulture in the keeping in the water. Oh, oh, oh my god. Oh, that was complete chaos. So I'm gonna take a moment while I'm sitting in the shade cooling off to talk to you about something that we all run into when fishing our favorite river, stream, or lake is what if you're fishing, like I am right here, and you catch a fish that's not in season or you or a fish that is protected, right? You can't fish for them. What, what do you do? And I think some people call that a bycatch, but you wanna take the responsible route, right? First and foremost, I would encourage everybody to fish with barbless hooks. If you're not fishing with barbless hooks, you're not gonna lose more fish if you play the fish well, keep a tight line, you're not gonna lose more fish by going barbless, but you are gonna protect the fish, especially if you're fishing in a fishery like this that has protected species in them. And specifically what we're talking about here are bull trout. Bull trout are endangered in my state, and though they live amongst the other trout that I'm fishing for, and I've caught some beautiful rainbows out of this system, but occasionally you do hook into a bull trout because they, they eat the same stuff, right? So what do you do? The key thing to do, right? Barbless hooks helps, right? And some fisheries are barbless anyway, but good practice, good practice to have. But you wanna keep the fish in the water. As much as you wanna take a picture, keep the fish in the water. Take a picture of the fish in the net as long as it's below the water line. Do your best not to touch the fish. You have to release the fish as quickly as possible without touching it and don't lift it out of the water. And I know it's cool when you catch a fish like this. I mean, they're. They're, they're pretty much endangered and somewhat rare in my state. It's a cool thing, but part of the reason why they're endangered is just because of the habitat changes, overfishing, and a lot of nefarious things that happened way back in the past, and we don't have to get into that. But what we can do moving forward to protect this native fish is just be super careful if we do accidentally have a bycatch when releasing it. Don't touch it, use barbless hooks, try to unhook it the best you can, if you want to take a picture, shove your phone under the water like I've done on many occasions and got some epic underwater shots, but do your best not to touch them, don't lift them up. And that's really the best practice if you catch a bycatch, which is a essentially a trout that's, uh, <laughs> I had a fish yanking on my rod. I'm kind of at least like dangling my, uh, my scopezilla. But that's, that's the best practice if you catch something that's endangered or something you're not allowed to catch in any river system. So. There's your responsibility tip of this fishing trip. Sidebar, don't mean to butt in here. Game wardens know, right? If you're trout fishing and you've got a seven and eight weight and because, you know, oh, there might be a steelhead in here, that's cheating. They're gonna get you for that. So it's it's truly if you're trout fishing and accidentally catch something that's not in season. So game wardens are savvy. So don't be fishing trout with an eight weight because uh, yeah, that might be frowned upon. Enjoying a little liquid sunshine out here in the Pacific Northwest. I'm gonna give you some great gift giving ideas for your favorite fly fisher in your life because I know it can be really tough to figure out what am I gonna get my spouse or my kids or my friends for the holidays. Oh, be sure to stick to the end of the video because I got a way that you can save even more money on some of these brands that we're gonna talk about today. So everything we're gonna be highlighting is privately owned, family owned, and operated. So I appreciate that support and I know they will too. So let's first start off with what I'm wearing right here. This is from Angry Minnow Vintage and this company does some really cool vintage outerwear, hats, hoodies, flannels, t-shirts. You've probably seen me wearing a lot of their stuff. I love supporting these guys and you really should take a look at their website. They've got a lot of cool stuff especially if you got some beer drinkers in your family that might appreciate some of the vintage beer stuff they have in t-shirts, hoodies, and hats. La, 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 la. The next thing I wanna highlight happens to be the hoodie that I'm wearing right here. Hellbender Nets, JD and Bailey make some incredible works of art, incredible functional works of art in these bamboo fishing, these landing nets. They are really just a beautiful net. I discovered, actually my wife discovered Hellbender probably about three years ago now, and I love spreading the gospel when it comes to these Hellbender nets. They just really are a work of art. And a lot of, we've had a few people say, well, you know, are they that strong, they're bamboo? 
If you Google bamboo, it has a higher compression strength than concrete. These things really are very durable, very flexible. And if I wouldn't, if I wouldn't have lost my first net down the river, it would still be going strong. But I've had several nets that I've been fishing for a couple years. And I know, you guys know how much I fish. Durable, beautiful nets. I mean, everyone comments on my net whenever I'm on the, on the river or on the lake. They're like, where'd you get that net? So check out Hellbender Nets. And I got a coupon code right here that'll help you save a little money this holiday season on Hellbender Nets. All right, so now with a click of my fingers, we're gonna be down at the Puget Sound Fly Shop and we're gonna to talk to the owner, Matt, and he's gonna show you some of the things that he brought in for the holiday season. All right, let's go talk to Matt. More Matt. <laughs> he's busy opening up his shop and I'm here early. And I'm gonna take you around his shop if you're looking for some gift giving ideas this year. He has got a ton of stuff in his shop and we're gonna take a look at some good ideas for that special someone that fly fishes in your life this holiday season. So let's take a look around the shop. Action. So coming down here for a great gift idea, I got these pens that are in my case right now. They are all handmade, including the boxes by a local um, individual. Um, so it's a great gift idea. They start out at $70 um, and come take a look at them. I have different styles of pens. So um, that's pretty cool. That's super cool. Also another great gift idea is these fish pond sandbar travel pouches. They're just nice to have, they're waterproof, put your knickknacks in there, as well as just getting retractors, some fly pucks here from Fish Pond as well. So it'd be a good idea for these, these, and these as a gift. Another <laughs> great gift idea here is these packs right here. I got hit packs, your regular lumbar packs, and then I also have your sling packs with a vest. Um, and then if you're one of those guys who like chest packs, I do definitely have those as well in stock. If you're also looking for another great gift idea, I got some price point glasses starting at $29.99. They're polarized, so it's an easy start to get into it. And then as you gradually move up, I got some guide wear, and then I got your um, SunCloud polarized glasses. And from the SunCloud ones, I also have Smith sunglasses as well. And those are starting off at about 200. Nice. So I'm a fan of fly shops who actually have flies in stock and Matt has a ton of flies. And right over my shoulder here are spay flies. And this is probably the largest selection of spay flies I have seen. That includes also the traditional spay flies. Pretty cool. Definitely something you wanna check out and fill up a box because he's got boxes over here as well. There's never enough nippers or forceps because raise your hand if you ever lost one. It's nice to have a backup. And check out this one from Dr. Slick, Black Widow. It's got a nice bend, so you can kind of get at the fly that might be buried down in one of the, your personal best trout that you just landed. That's pretty darn cool, pretty innovative. So I have this guy down here that uh, he goes ahead and he creates this fish artwork. Um, this is also another great gift idea, um, just to have something in your man cave hung up on the wall. Um, he does a great job, um, so it might be something to look at. Those are badass. Another great gift idea is this Fish Pond uh, Fly Tires Travel Bag. It's all um, protected from your tools so they can't stab through. Then you can go ahead and select patterns or material in here and it gives you all the pouches. And then it has one big pouch in here and then it also has for your thread on the inside and then for your vise. If you have a pedestal, even if you don't, it still locks down. But it's a great gift idea for that uh, fly tire. That's great. So one of the things I would recommend for somebody who has a lot of gear is this bag right here. I have this bag myself and it is great for traveling. I've got all my reels and they're all protected in their own individual compartments. I think I've stuffed up to almost like nine fly rods in their socks in this section. You can put a lot of other knickknacks. I literally have every single thing I need when I'm on one of my trips to whether it's Pyramid Lake, Eastern Washington, I want a hot spot anything. <laughs> Eastern Washington, bringing all my stuff. This is a really great travel pack for all of your fly reels and fly rods and fly gear, really. Next, we're gonna talk about Drift Waders. Drift is out of Bellingham, Washington, designed by Nick and Sam 
two steelheaders that knew what they wanted and knew what fishermen wanted when it comes to waders. These waders really are top of the line waders at 40% less than what you would typically find on some of the big brand names. They're just a great waiter. Mine have been bulletproof. I have torture tested these things. I'm super happy with them. They've got great storage. There's some great design. There's a lot of innovation that goes into these waders. If you're looking for a second pair of waders or you want to upgrade to the Pro Zip, like I have because I love my Primo Zip waders, so easy to get in and out of. I've got a coupon code here as well that'll save you a little bit of money on the checkout. And I know Nick and Sam will appreciate the support and so do I, so thank you in advance. <laughs> All right, now let's talk about fishonrods.com. This is my company, Neil and I, my business partner and rod builder. We started up the FFD rod company, fishonrods.com. Really, the bottom line is you're getting a rod that's built to a seven, eight, nine hundred thousand dollar spec for under $500. We wanted to make premium gear more accessible to everyone, and these things really are a great rod. Now, when you design a rod to make it easier for somebody new or a veteran to cast a fly rod, it is just, it really is a, a, a wonderful thing, right? When the rod really helps you out with the casting process, and that's what this rod does. It is designed to just cast better. It has a great touch, great finesse, lots of power. You know, we use that rod blank, that parabolic power taper that has a perfect transfer of energy from fly rod to fly line, and it just shoots the line out there effortlessly. Now granted, you do need to pair it up with a good fly line, and that's why I've also partnered up with a 115-year-old family-owned company, Cortland Fly Lines. You can trust these fly lines to, to get the job done and really enhance your fly rod, right? The fly rod and the fly line, it's when you have two of those quality components together, your fly fishing experience is just a whole lot better. So if you're looking to get new line, please check out Cortland as well. Oh my God, I almost forgot. We are running free shipping on all fly rods through Black Friday. I get a ton of questions about my rod holder. It's from O Pros. These are three brothers that own Outdoor Professionals. I absolutely love my third hand rod holder. So that is a great stocking stuffer for any fly fisher that wants to be able to carry a second rod. And even if they don't want to carry a second rod, it's a nice place to set your rod while you're gearing up so you're not setting it on the ground or setting it in the river or lake or wherever else, right? The O Pros rod holder really is a, one of the best accessories that I've run across in a long time. You may remember a very good friend of mine has finally gotten through his cancer treatment. It's looking good. He needs something to do. So he's building some really cool fly boxes and then some other things that are gonna be fly fishing related with, 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 with woodworking, that's what I'm trying to say. But check out these fly boxes. You're supporting him and just kind of keeping him busy, but it, it really, they are a beautiful fly box. So if you want something that is functional, but maybe you wanna sit on your desk or in your fly fishing room because it just looks so cool, Check out these fly boxes that Jeff Ramsey's making. They're just really a beautiful box. All right, so now let's talk about one of the biggest innovations in fly fishing in the last decade, and that is the Oros indicator. Yes, it's not a bobber, it's an indicator. <laughs> okay, maybe it's kind of a fancy bobber, but the Oros indicator, I love these things. No more twisting of the line, no more chafing of the line, no more squashing of the line to where you have this this weak spot to where you could lose a fish, right? Because the line is compromised. Orals are easy to move around and it doesn't mess up your line, right? It, no more twisting, it is great. So be sure to check out Oros indicators. Oros, they are a game changer. Okay, so how do you save a little bit more money? How you save a little more money is be a part of my email list. Now, this is not managed by anybody but myself and Neil. So if you get an email from me, it's coming from me. And I also promise you not to spam you to death. But a lot of times there's some exclusive offers that I can offer my private audience. So be sure to go on to fishonrods.com. You can kind of see right there, enter your email address. But my private community gets to save a little more money on some of these premium gear that we're talking about today. So be sure to describe, subscribe on fishonrods.com and be a part of my community and thank you in advance. I think I gave you some pretty solid gift giving ideas. So thanks again for supporting me and these family owned companies. I know everyone will appreciate it. All right, everybody, till the next time, fish on.